gentle, and of course, very modern apes, I regret to inform you that this is another Robert Sepper video. For those of you who don't know, Robert Sepper is a guy who hangs out on YouTube, and he's like if you took a lot of those bad shows from the Discovery Channel and the History Channel after they went downhill, and you just distilled them into a single living creature. Ancient Aliens, Finding Bigfoot, and Mermaids the Body Found. These were the ingredients chosen to create the funniest YouTube conspiracy theorist, but Professor Utonium accidentally added an extra ingredient to the concoction, Hunting Hitler. <laughs> Thus, Robert Sepper was born. I wanted my last video on this guy titled Robert Sepper is a bad anthropologist to be kind of the last word that I said on him because he's kind of a goon and I don't really want to waste any more time on the guy. But then... What? I love garbage. One, his fans brigaded my channel, which was of course very funny and gave me the opportunity to read some of these bonkers comments as some sort of easy content. So thank you, Robert Sepper fans, for that. It also gave me an opportunity to point out that of hundreds of comments, only one of them actually tried to address anything scientific that I said with regard to Robert's claims. The rest, and I do mean the rest, opting instead to call me a jealous SJW woman who is Jewish. You can't get away with that. You're dead. Biting commentary. My previous video read aloud some of Robert Sepper's tweets before his Twitter was shut down, and I do think that those tweets were super racist. But because Robert Sepper fans have the focus and attention span of a salmon, they were unable to comment about anything else other than the fact that I was a mean and shrewd femoid. They ignored all of the well-sourced breakdowns about why Robert Sepper is chronically wrong about biological anthropology, even going so far as to say, give me a timestamp for where she makes the arguments. It, you could have just looked for yourself. It, it's, there's a lot in there. That's why today's video is going to be focusing exclusively on how Robert Sepper is objectively wrong rather than some of his many personal flaws. If you want to know why Robert Sepper is a garbage anthropologist, you can find that here. If you want to know why he's a bad person, links in the description. And if you want to know why I think that Robert Sepper is a grifter, we'll get there. Which leads me to number two of the things that happened. Right after I released my video criticizing Robert Sepper, he released two videos uh, talking about the subject that I had criticized him for, biological anthropology. And I watched them, and this will come as perhaps no surprise, but he didn't address any of the criticism that I levied against him in those videos. In fact, uh, he also just didn't correct himself for any of the things that he got like factually objectively wrong that I pointed out. And he also got more new things wrong. It's the trifecta of doubling down. The extra funny thing about these videos that Robert released in my area of expertise is right before he released them, he put out a community post that's like, look, I actually do have a degree in anthropology, and it's just bloated with comments of people saying, don't listen to this evil woman, Robert. Don't bother responding. Whatever you do, she's not worth your time. And then he just did two videos, <laughs> like vaguely aimed at me, because narcissists just can't help themselves. And the third thing that happened is that in that community post, Robert shows himself holding his degree to prove to me and everyone else that he does in fact have a degree in anthropology. I can't really read what it says, but from other people who have investigated it for me, I've been told that it's California State University, Northridge, and that it's legit. So, because in my previous video, I expressed doubt that Robert actually has this degree that he says he has, uh, I would like to take this moment and apologize to Robert Sepper. You do have a degree in anthropology. But I also think that it's only humane that we start a Kickstarter for Robert Sepper to recoup his financial losses given he paid for a degree in anthropology that evidently didn't teach him the difference between Australopithecus and Ardipithecus, or what the Piltdown hoax actually was. Or they did, and Robert is just a really bad student.
The link to donate to the Robert Sepper is a shoddy student foundation can be found in the description. So let's catalog all of the times that Robert Sepper is wrong in his two new videos and remark about his inability to address his previous misconceptions along the way. We will go ahead and say his name, Robert Sepper, an overly gratuitous amount of times because, as Robert Sepper fans have pointed out, I am just using his name to garner attention like the duplicitous femoid that I truly am. We will begin with Robert's first video, titled Human Evolution Monkey Business Debunking Out of Africa Theory. Uh, he already has a video titled Debunking Out of Africa Theory, but it's fine, like he, he wants to do a double down, so it only makes sense that the video title would be something similar. I know a little something about this. To refresh your memory, my support for the Out of Africa set of hypotheses in both my Robert Sepper's About Anthropologist video and otherwise comes from several lines of evidence. There is, of course, the fossil support, which shows us that the oldest hominin fossils with conceivably Homo sapiens features are indeed found in Africa. But more importantly, perhaps, is the genetic support. Massive databases of modern Homo sapiens genomes, as well as archaic DNA that we have pulled from numerous different types of hominins, demonstrably show that we do, we as in Homo sapiens, originate in the African continent, specifically in the East, most likely. Specifically, we focus on four primary lines of evidence. One, modern human diversity is highest in Africa, as compared to everywhere else. Two, Looking at phylogeny, we all nest within the African continent. All human populations can trace their nesting, their nested hierarchy, back to Africa. Three, heterozygosity is highest in the African continent. And four, linkage disequilibrium is highest outside of the African continent. Now keep these points in mind, because we're going to see if and how Robert addresses them in his next two videos, because that's how response videos, however vague they may be, actually work. You have to address the criticism levied against you, otherwise it's just doubling down. We call that the Donny Deals fallacy. Showing why criticism of your idea is unfounded is also just kind of how arguing for your idea works, but I digress. The Robert Sepper video we're looking at first begins with a ukulele cover, as all of them do, but this one is a cover of the Rolling Stones song, Paint It Black. This is in reference to the fact that Robert is trying to say Out of Africa is wrong, and that we are effectively painting human history black by arguing for it. It's not subtle. Today, Robert is making his points from the LA Zoo, so he starts the video by talking about flamingos and turtles before remarking that he's interested in the primates today, and he starts making his way over towards the gorillas. As much fun as it is to watch these turtles swim around, my main reason for today's visit was to spend some time with the primates, which includes over 200 species, and the one that I was most interested in seeing today was the gorilla. He lists some generic facts about gorillas before saying this. That said, despite their enormous strength, gorillas seem to be afraid of certain reptiles, such as chameleons and caterpillars. It's okay, Robert. What's a phylum among friends? He also notes that gorillas won't cross streams because they don't like to get wet. And they also don't like water and will cross streams only if they can do so without getting wet. I don't think they like getting wet, but, but they will cross streams if need be. Just a little nitpick. Robert hangs out with gorillas for a moment, then chimps. He briefly talks about Coco, the classic gorilla that learned sign language, was proficient in it at least, and was capable of understanding and responding to thousands of human words. He mentions briefly Kanzi, who was a bonobo who was tested in a more objective way using a lexigram. And then he talks about these chimpanzees at the Primate Research Institute at Kyoto University in Japan, and how they're capable of outperforming humans with regard to short-term memory tasks. All throughout this, he's showing very long clips of Coco or 
brief ones of Kanzi or the chimpanzee uh, news report at Kyoto University, and it takes up like 10 minutes of the total video. I thought briefly here that Robert was getting it. Humans are indeed very intelligent, but so are our closest living relatives. Chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas, orangutans. He touches briefly on most of these, and I kind of thought that, especially when he showed the chimpanzee memory test, that he was appreciating sort of this unity of the hominids, that we all have this cognitive advantage over other families. This is kind of where we've put all our eggs into the intelligence basket, and that it's very interesting that they even surpass us in some very specific ways. But then he just asserts that this fact that other hominids are intelligent too, and even surpass us, actually flies in the face of evolutionary preconceptions. Evolution is supposed to be linear, anagenetic, and always upscaling towards this ultimate life form. The study from Japan speaks to the adaptive intelligence of the chimps, which in that particular memory demonstration surpasses the performance of the human test subject, and is counterintuitive if one goes by the assumption that there must be a linear progression from inferior to superior in regards to primate and human evolution. And like, he's just doing the creationism thing here, right? Evolution does not, nor has it ever claimed, that organisms are proceeding towards some ultimate superior fitness form that is excellent in every single environment it encounters. And this is because evolution is in fact constrained by the environment that the organism lives in. What is superior in one environment may actually be inferior in another. What is fit is context specific and as a result there is no ultimate fitness that can be applied to any environment. Now, there are some old school ideas in human evolution that our species is the exception, that our cognition allowed us to manipulate the environment so well, so proficiently, that we are some kind of ultimate superior level of fitness overall compared to the rest of the animal kingdom. But this idea of human exceptionalism has really fallen by the wayside in the past two to three decades as we've continued to pull up evidence that other hominins were capable of doing much of the same things that we are, from Neanderthals to Homo erectus. This is in conjunction with the abilities that we've now seen that our living kin are capable of, from chips and bonobos, gorillas to orangutans. And we're not really certain why we're the only ones left, because Neanderthals actually had larger brains than at least modern Homo sapiens. It may be that we're loaded in a different way than they are. We have very much an emphasis on our frontal lobes, while Neanderthals are very much focused on their occipital lobes. Some have proposed that this would have made Neanderthals absolute experts at certain activities, whereas humans, Homo sapiens, is generally more of a jack of all trades. We were more adaptable. So when the climate eventually changed, humans were able to respond quicker to these new pressures than Neanderthals, and thus we were the ones that made it through this sort of new trial applied to the hominins of the world. But it could also be luck. We're just not entirely sure yet. The point is, humans are very special animals, but so is everything else. We are unique, but we aren't exceptional. What I've just explained is really just the current state of the literature. It's what the folks of the field currently think is the case, the arguments that they're making, and the truth that they're trying to parse out. This means that the way that Robert is arguing here is very creationist in nature. He's fighting with the science of a quarter century ago in order to appear more reasonable in comparison. It also suggests to me that Robert is perhaps not keeping up or reading the current literature, uh, which is something that anyone claiming to be an anthropologist would be doing. Ah, but I hear you saying he just talked about Coco and this experiment at Kyoto University with the chimpanzees, so in a way, he is at least a little bit keeping up with the current literature. And you're right, so why is he arguing with a paleoanthropological argument from the 70s? Linear evolution, or anagenesis in the case of the hominin line, has not been very popular since then. So why is this what he's fighting with? 
seems kind of weird for an anthropologist to do. Robert goes on to basically summarize what I touched on moments ago, that superior is in fact relative. You can't judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree. As each species expresses its intelligence differently and in accordance to the environment in which it evolved or adapted to, which is often changing. In other words, a fish is superior when it comes to surviving in the water. A bird is exceptional in terms of thriving during flight and a monkey exceeds in its survival in the trees. All life forms possess a unique form of intelligence expressed in accordance to its environment, and the notion that humanity is currently at life's zenith, or even its own pinnacle, may be a hasty conclusion. But he does so in a way that almost feels like he thinks he's the first to suggest it, and again, implies that this observation of his flies in the face of evolutionary theory. So why then, I ask you, did Charles Darwin make the same point hundreds of years ago in his seminal text on the origin of species? I guess Robert just knows more about evolution and what it predicts than like the guy who put the theory to paper. Next, Robert talks about orangutans, mispronouncing the name, as so many do. Known for their distinctive red fur, orangutans are great apes native to the rainforests of Indonesia and Malaysia. And he then goes on to appreciate, thankfully, how intelligent these animals are, how intelligent all hominids are, uh, before remarking that their intelligence is evident, but that the transition from an ancient tree-dwelling Miocene ape uh, to a bipedal primate is simply not. The innate intelligence of many primates that have been studied is very apparent, but what isn't so clear is the alleged and assumed transition from a tree-dwelling primate into a bipedal one. Robert goes back and forth in the videos that he creates on whether or not he accepts humans as primates. It's really difficult to see whether he actually does or not, but in this one he seems to be okay with it, so we're going to operate like he is and continue. The incumbent theory presented by mainstream academia is that roughly 60 million years ago, pro-simians took to the trees. Pro means before, simian means monkey or ape. So after the cataclysmic event that ended the age of the dinosaurs, a theoretical mammal called a pro-simian, similar to a rodent, is said to have moved into what became trees and allegedly evolved into monkeys. Some monkeys then came down from the trees and began spending part of the time on the ground, evolving into apes with chimps and gorillas stemming from a common ancestor about 10 million years ago. Then, as the theory goes, somewhere between 5 and 7 million years ago, as I was taught, apes allegedly transitioned into bipedal hominins, which then supposedly gave rise to humans. So as a layman summary, this is fine. As a summary by an anthropologist, which Robert is, it is rife with mistakes. Apes are not a sister group to humans. They are the superfamily to which we belong, hominoidia. And hominoids evolved in the trees where they thrived during the Miocene. Now, some suppose that we evolve or descend from hominins that were sort of predisposed to bipedality because of the orthograde posture that they held in the trees due to a suspensory lifestyle. Others think that we went through a knuckle walking phase. I tend to find the former more compelling, but either way, the idea is that we descend from apes and are still apes in the way that we descend from mammals and still are mammals. He also says that prosimians were like rat-like creatures that moved into the trees. Prosimians are lemurs and galagos, streptorines, things like that. So they're not rats, they're primates already. By the time you get to your prosimians, you are already in the order primates. So that's not right. This progenitor mammal that moved into the trees may have gave rise to things like plesiodapiforms or other primatiforms that would eventually become the order primates or have descendants that would be in the order primates. But we can give them a little bit of a break because it's meant to be a brief summary, uh, but it is like wrong a lot. With some desperate studies recently claiming that early humans were still swinging from the trees two million years ago, which I find laughable. So this is a very strange way to characterize literature, 
And I'm really not sure what's going on here. I'm not sure the position that Robert is actually taking. It sounds to me like he thinks that the human relative in question is being manipulated into telling a story of something that still maintained arboreal capabilities. But if that's the case, then it's also a very wrong way of characterizing the literature. Let me explain why. The study in question that Robert has on the screen discusses the morphology of a hominin called Australopithecus sediba that lived 1.98 or approximately 2 million years ago. The fact that he refers to it as an early human makes me think that he accepts that it's a part of the human lineage and takes issue with the fact that the study came to the conclusion that it still maintained arboreal capabilities. But here's the weird thing. Robert has in the past consistently, vehemently rejected the idea that humans are actually related to Lucy species, Australopithecus afarensis, and he rejects this idea on the basis that Lucy species may have retained some arboreal capabilities. My own analysis is that neither Lucy or Artie, which were a little over three feet tall, walked upright at all, and were both primarily tree dwellers. Artistic reconstructions in museums are deceptive, showing erect, upright models with human-like feet, which is a fraud. Now, as I've said many times on the channel, we know that Lucy species Australopithecus afarensis was a biped on the ground because it necessarily had to be from a biomechanical standpoint. It had a valgus knee, a bull-shaped pelvis with sagittally oriented iliac blades, an anterior foramen magnum, and its foot morphology has an inline big toe and three arches in the foot. That last point Robert contests, but only because he consistently mixes up the foot of Artipithecus ramidus, a completely different hominin that lived over a million years earlier with Lucy species. Lovejoy has published more than 100 articles related to his research and is most well known for his work on reconstructing Lucy, an alleged human ancestor with an opposable big toe on its feet, meaning they resembled thumbs for grasping branches and climbing trees. So Owen Lovejoy is well known for his work with Australopithecus afarensis, which is Lucy's species, and reconstructing the locomotion style of that genus in general. But uh, did you catch the little snafu there, ladies and gentlemen? Because those feet he showed with the divergent halix or big toe, those were from Artipithecus ramidus, not an Australopithecine. An honest mistake to make. After all, they both start with the letter A. Oh wait, he's supposed to be an anthropologist, which means he's supposed to have taken biological anthropology an introductory course for freshmen. And these guys, at least in my lab, are taught the difference between these two genera of hominin. That's his problem though, not ours. Australopithecus afarensis though, in my opinion, did maintain some aspects of her morphology that would have allowed her to be at least adept in the trees. Namely, she has curved fingers and toes that would have allowed for easier branch gripping. Although this isn't as good as having an opposable toe, like Artipithecus furlier, it could make it easier in the trees than the hominin feet that we would see later in the likes of Homo habilis. Now, he evidently didn't read the study in question, the desperate study, because the early human relative in question is, again, Australopithecus sediba in the same genus as Lucy, Australopithecus afarensis. And the same arguments in this desperate study Namely, those curved fingers and toes are used to argue that Australopithecus sediba maintained some level of arboreality swinging through the trees, although it would have been more like careful clamoring, that Robert accepts when it is applied to Lucy. So to summarize, Robert thinks that Australopithecus afarensis, or Lucy species, cannot be a human relative because it's too arboreal, due in part to the curved fingers and toes that he remarks upon. However, Australopithecus sediba, which is, he thinks, an early human, I guess he doesn't know that it's a member of genus Australopithecus, uh, is only argued to be arboreal due to the desperate musings of a pathetic study which argues that it's arboreal due to the curved fingers and toes. So he accepts curved fingers and toes as an argument for Lucy's arboreality, but not the very same argument for Australopithecus sedibus. Kinda weird, huh? 
Now I'm thinking, if you're Robert, why not just argue that Australopithecus sediba is just like Australopithecus afarensis and that neither of them can be human relatives because they're both too arboreal? And I think the reason is because Robert is aware of too much of the morphology of Australopithecus sediba and he knows that it has to be a biped when it's on the ground. Therefore, he has to argue that it can't be arboreal. It's basically the opposite of the condition for Lucy, at least as far as Robert is aware, because I don't think he knows of other Australopithecus afarensis fossils. The problem then becomes both Australopithecus sediba and Australopithecus afarensis have the adaptations to be efficient bipeds on the ground, the inline big toe, three arches, bull-shaped pelvis, anterior foramen magnum, and valgus knee, and they both have the adaptations to maintain at least decent movement in the trees, the curved fingers and toes, and I didn't mention this earlier, but they have more dorsally oriented scapulae or shoulder blades. So what is Robert to do? The worst part about this is later in the video, Robert will characterize human evolution as needing this missing link to connect arboreal hominins and terrestrial bipedal hominins, which is exactly what Australopithecus afarensis and Australopithecus sediba are, among many other hominins, but these are the ones that he specifically talks about, and they meet the criteria that he basically lays out. Not a good look. At the end of the day, it's just another example of you being stupid. Almost all archaeological digs in Africa focus exclusively in the strata focusing on the time period hypothesized for this missing link. So the strata thing is just false. Africa, the continent, has great fossils from pretty much all time periods. The Karoo Formation in South Africa, for instance, dates to around 320 million years ago, or the Permian, and surprise, surprise, there's no hominins. The theoretical specimen demonstrating a primate transition into bipedalism, but has remained elusive, especially for researchers whose paychecks do not depend on corporate or federally funded academic institutions. The pictures that he chooses to show put his ignorance on full display. Now I've talked about Sehalanthropus chidensis plenty on this channel, uh, so link in the description as to why the article he just showed uh, jumps the gun, but he keeps showing articles, right? Not papers or studies from the actual literature, but the pop science articles that cover and summarize these papers. So I don't understand why he doesn't just go to the original source material, but moreover, each of these pop science articles that highlights the arboreal retentions of Australopithecus afarensis or Lucy also points out that this thing was a biped when it was on the ground, and those arboreal retentions are again the same ones from the pathetic desperate study that Robert finds completely laughable. So, you know, again, like not anthropologist behavior, right? He finally gets the pilt down hooks right though. At long last, the man can truly be taught. Robert, babe, you're doing great, keep at it. Like the pilt down man, which was a baboon's jaw glued onto a human skull. Baboon's jaw, baboon's jaw, baboon's jaw, turning out to be an ape's jaw, fraudulently bleached and then glued onto a human skull. He also brings up the Nebraska Man hoax, which was actually just a mistake. Some folks who weren't anthropologists thought a peccary tooth belonged to some mysterious North American hominin, and then anthropologists saw it and were like, it's a peccary tooth. This article published by BBC is titled, We Still Have Not Found the Missing Link Between Us and Apes, that not only admits that we haven't found anything that resembles the last common ancestor between humans and apes, labeled the missing link, but goes on to state that there isn't even agreement among anthropologists on what the last common ancestor might have looked like. Again, Robert shows us that he cannot even read the articles that he deigns to put on screen. As such, my expectations that he may someday read the papers that the articles are actually based off of is evidently just a pipe dream. That said, the article defines the missing link as the last common ancestor of humans and the other African apes. 
Now, in my opinion, finding that particular species is basically impossible. This is because of the nature of how evolution actually works. The oldest population to split from its parent group is going to be virtually indistinguishable from that group. This is why it's easy to look at something like Artipithecus as a genus and say, yes, these are clearly hominins. They have many of the clade-defining traits that makes a hominin a hominin. Let's say, for example, that the first hominin trait to appear is a reduction of the canine teeth in both males and females of a species. Well, the very first hominins are going to be pretty indistinguishable from just small-toothed Miocene apes. It's not until you get maybe two or three of the characteristics that define a clade that something starts to become recognizably and pretty unambiguously a member those that come before it are going to be a lot harder to pin down. This is how we know that evolution is legit. The lines get blurry, the edges are fuzzy, and everything ends up being a pretty big gradient. But we don't need the definitive last common ancestor of the hominines to know that humans descend from some kind of generalized Miocene ape. This is because we have dozens of progressively less basal hominins stretching over 7 million years, thousands upon thousands of individual specimens chronicling the emergence of bipedalism and big brains. Now, just last week, it turns out that a hominin specimen touted as humanity's earliest ancestor was not a hominin and thus was not the earliest known human ancestor. In a paper published in Journal of Human Evolution, a team of researchers from France have found evidence that the Sahelanthropus chadensis, which mainstream anthropologists claimed walked upright between 6.8 and 7.2 million years ago, which is twice as long ago as the famous Lucy dated to about 3.2 million years ago, actually did not walk upright and thus was not a hominin, but instead an ape ancestor that walked on all fours like gorillas and other great apes. So it was not a hominin and was therefore not an early human ancestor. Oh really, Robert? A week ago? <laughs> So I've covered this topic to death, but for the sake of being thorough, I'm going to cover it again. So one to two years ago, Machiarelli et al., so this guy Machiarelli and his team, came out with a paper that was examining new postcranial material from Sahelanthropus chidensis, a hominin that lived 7 million years ago. Specifically, they looked at the cross-section of the diaphysis, or long portion of the femur, and they noted that the cross-section was more similar to panins than it was to hominins, suggesting that it wasn't indicative of bipedality. Now, normally, this is the part where I say, yes, and as a response, Franck Guy, another, I believe he's French, researcher and paleoanthropologist, looked at two ulnae as well as the femur in conjunction with the actual skull of this animal and came to the conclusion that when you look at the full suite, it's pretty unambiguously a habitual biped. And this is also the part where I say, but hey, that paper is still in preprint. It's not actually been published yet because it's still waiting uh, full peer review in nature. And then I usually say, which is why, you know, we have to be careful because when things are currently in peer review, they're subject to change. However, just today, and I do mean today, we got that paper released. I'm just gonna read the abstract here because I wanna go over the paper in slightly greater detail here in a little bit, maybe within the hour as I'm recording this. The paper is titled Postcranial Evidence of Late Miocene Hominin Bipedalism in Chad, and the abstract states bipedal locomotion is one of the key adaptations that define the hominin clade. Evidence of bipedalism is known from the postcranial remains of late Miocene hominins as early as 6 million years ago in eastern Africa. Bipedality of Sahelanthropus chidensis was hitherto inferred about 7 million years ago in eastern Africa, Chad, based off of cranial evidence. Here we present postcranial evidence of the locomotor behavior of Sahelanthropus Chidensis with new insights into bipedalism at this early stage of hominin evolutionary history. The original material was discovered at the locality of TM-266 of the Tauros Manala fossiliferous area and consists of one femur and two left and right ulnae. The morphology of the femur is most parsimonious with habitual bipedality and the ulnae preserve evidence of substantial arboreal behavior. Taken together, these findings suggest hominins were already bipeds at around 7 million years ago, but also suggest that arboreal clamoring was probably 
a significant portion of their locomotor repertoire. This will probably go completely over Robert's head though because he cannot seem to grasp the concept that a creature can actually have bipedality when on the ground and still maintain some arboreal activities. This is incredible to me because some human cultures today still exploit resources that require climbing trees, and we certainly don't have those supposedly big toes anymore, do we? That said, we don't even have transitional forms between Australopithecus, such as Lucy, and the Homo genus, which includes bipedal hominins such as Habilis, Erectus, Denisovans, and Neanderthal, not to mention Cro-Magnon, or modern humans. This is also just really silly. We have a glut of hominin fossils that display the acquisition of bipedality from habitual all the way to facultative, like we maintain today in our own species. And yet the mainstream media and academia tries very hard to force obsolete paradigms to work, despite persistent and obvious gaps in the fossil record, which seem to be pushed to support a political agenda, like out of Africa theory, which involves claims that an ape-like foot with a big toe that sticks out to the angle like a thumb, obviously used for grabbing branches, was actually a bipedal hominin ancestor displayed in many museums. Okay, so maybe Robert isn't quite as open to learning as I initially thought. Let it be known that Robert Sepper Anthropologist still doesn't know the difference between Ardipithecus, that hominin shown with the divergent toe in the picture, and Australopithecus, those models that are shown immediately after that are shown in museums. These are two different genera that lived millions of years apart in some cases. So I just, I, Rob, you gotta get this straight. But that hominin with the divergent big toe, Ardipithecus, was also a biped. I'm sure you're wondering, how is it possible that we can construe something with such an opposable big toe as being a biped when on the ground? Is this the work, perhaps, of the political agenda of an Afrocentric woke mob? No. It actually couldn't have been a knuckle walker when on the ground and was necessarily a biped due to the biomechanical restraints of its morphology. Like modern humans, but unlike chimpanzees and gorillas, Ardipithecus actually has an anterior foramen magnum so that it could hold its head upright on top of its vertebral column, allowing for an orthograde posture and bipedal locomotion when on the ground. Coincidentally, this would have also helped it clamber about in the trees, where its big toe would additionally come in handy. Its pelvis, like ours, is very bowl-shaped, but interestingly enough, it's not totally equipped for the type of bipedality that we use today and that Australopiths were far more on the way towards. Instead, the ilia of the pelvis are somewhat human-like, more towards the homo end of the spectrum, while the ischia, the lower portion of the pelvis, is still decently primitive. But this is a single fused bone. So boy, doesn't that feel, oh, I don't know, a bit transitional? Gibbons, which are extant apes that live beside us today, and my favorite type of primate, are also bipedal on the ground, and they have an even more primitive pelvic morphology, which goes to show that you can have a combination of arboreal behavior and bipedality on the ground, even with morphologies more primitive than what we see in Ardipithecus and Australopithecus. Not only do I have a problem with the simian anatomy, that some anthropologists try to pass off as bipedal, meaning upright walking. Nothing that walked upright, like we do, had all that fur. Unlike apes and monkeys, we sweat a lot. And there's an explanation for this, which has to do with how bipedal hominins hunted. People cannot outrun most animals, like a gazelle for example, which can reach speeds of up to 60 miles per hour in short bursts. But it cannot sustain that for hours. People, however, can run for long periods of time, and this is demonstrated in marathon runners, where sweating becomes a necessity to be able to cool off after running down animals right before plunging a weapon into its exhausted body. So these upright, bipedal, hairy specimen with hands as feet, allegedly almost human, are paleo art and created to push a political agenda, not a scientific one. 
Except no one is suggesting that Ardipithecus or Australopithecus were long distance runners. They suggest that it's bipedal on the ground when moving from tree patch to tree patch in wooded environments, which is something that the paleoenvironmental studies of these ancient habitats that they lived in pretty well confirms. You might be wondering, why were these hominins moving bipedally when coming to the ground instead of quadrupedally like baboons and macaques do today when they're moving from tree patch to tree patch? And the answer is, turns out moving bipedally is actually just more efficient than moving quadrupedally. That might lead you to wonder, okay, well then why isn't everything a biped? And the answer is probably just that very few animals are actually predisposed to adapt this locomotor style, or making the transition from a quadruped in the trees to a biped on the ground. This is why I'm particularly compelled by the idea that we descend from something that was suspensory in the trees rather than something that was a knuckle walker. And we have quite a bit of paleoanthropological support for this given there are plenty of Miocene apes which held their bodies upright in the trees, more or less, and moved around by clamoring with all four limbs. It's not very much of a stretch then to suggest that when they would come down to the ground, they would stay upright and hold their arms up as they moved from patch to patch. This isn't a difficult transition to make. The tough part is making it efficient. This is where hominins like Ardipithecus and Australopithecus really come in. As we can see, their pelvis take on a more efficient shape, their knees pull underneath the body, the foot take on a more efficient weight transfer shape, including the arches and the inline big toe, and a more upright shoulders back posture than previous organisms. Now humans are obviously excellent long distance runners and superb sweaters, but Australopiths may occupy a perfect transitional space here as well, because when we use the molecular clock to look at relative hairiness, it seems that Australopiths were already losing some of that fur cover in favor of more skin and likely more echo and glands. It's also been argued by some of the classic Australopith researchers like Owen Lovejoy that these guys were near human level as far as walking efficiency. All aspects of the out of Africa theory lacks empirical evidence, from how races came to be to the hominin origins coming from tree dwellers. No ancient origin myth or religion attributes our start to monkeys. Many of them in fact claim that apes evolved from us where the common ancestor took to the trees after some sort of global cataclysm and instead of the other way around. I don't really care about this. Lots of world religions also have human-animal hybrids in their mythologies, and yet, surprisingly, the globe is deficient in centaurs. If this sounds counterintuitive to you, it's now being proposed by members of the scientific community, so it's worth taking a look for yourself since the media has no incentive to report on such things. The argument that chimpanzees and gorillas, both knuckle-walking apes, may descend from a Miocene ape that was an upright suspensory clamorer, perhaps more similar to hominins than it was to what would become chimpanzees and gorillas, isn't really off the table. But the fact remains that gorillas, chimps, Miocene apes, and all hominins, including humans, are apes that share a common ancestor. That said, the revolution in genomics since the sequencing of DNA from all races, including archaic hominin races, which is a fancy way of saying ancient people, has demonstrated that we are all made up of various species of people that had different blood types, were adapted to different environments, but that does not answer the pivotal question, if we did not come down from the trees, where did humanity come from? We'll tackle the genetic stuff here in a minute, but humans did come down from the trees, right? Like our fossil record shows unambiguously that we see arboreal adaptations transitioning into terrestrial bipedal ones slowly over geologic time. And no amount of Robert not knowing his hominins will change that. Turning to myth and folklore, we have stories of people dwelling in subterranean habitats, coming to the surface, 
such as the Hopi Indian legends. He goes on for a minute about humans maybe coming from subterranean caves, but I covered all of this in my aquatic ape video. So then he goes on to say that Darwinian evolution has no explanation for RH negative blood types. Which might sound implausible to some, but at least starts to solve mysteries such as RH negative blood type, which modern traditional Darwinian anthropology has no solution for. <laughs> Oh, that's not so much. So? I had no idea. Then Robert does this argument again. Hybrid humans existed in prehistory. For example, Neanderthals and modern humans, or Cro-Magnon, interbred from 35,000 to about 28,000 years ago. Europeans have between 1 and 5% Neanderthal genetics, while the percentage is even greater in East Asians. Sub-Saharan Africans have a trace amount of Neanderthal DNA, even though no Neanderthal has ever been found in Sub-Saharan Africa. The reason is because after hybridization in Europe, hybridized Europeans entered into Africa and interbred with an archaic ghost species, which got its name because it's only been detected genetically in the DNA of people from Sub-Saharan Africa and has not yet been identified in the fossil record. So modern Africans are a hybrid race of the ghost species, which I suspect is Homo erectus or another very archaic hominin, and Europeans who already had interbred with Neanderthal. In other words, there absolutely and conclusively was no out of Africa in the sense of sub-Saharan African people leaving Africa and magically mutating into Asians and then Caucasians. This obsolete hypothesis will go down in history as a bigger fraud than the Piltdown Man. Okay, that was a lot of information, and Robert also does this one all the time, so let's break it down for him yet again, and this time we're gonna really make it simple. The majority of modern humans have the DNA of other hominins in their genomes. As Robert correctly pointed out, and I noticed because it's oh so rare, generally European people have Neanderthal DNA, 1-5%, to and Asian people have Denisovan's DNA, up to 12%. Robert notes that North Africans have up to 19% of a ghost hominin in their own DNA. He also supposes that this DNA probably came from something he deems super archaic, like Homo erectus. Finally, Robert suggests that each race is a hybrid and implies that the African hybrid with this ghost lineage is the most primitive. So what does the paper he's pulling this idea from actually say? The paper examined primarily West and North Africans and roughly looked at 405 individuals, including folks from the Yoruba and Mende tribes. In the genomes of these folks, they detected non-Homo sapiens DNA and decided to compare it to the Denisovans and Homo neanderthalensis genomes that we already have, and they found that this new DNA matched neither of them. It's from a different hominin, one that we don't yet have any fossils of. Because we don't have any fossils of this mysterious donor, we call it a ghost lineage in terminology. Now, the percentage average for these people was about 6.6% .6 for the Yoruba and 7% for the Mende. This is noticeably lower than the percentage of Denisovan DNA in some folks of Asian descent. But Robert leaves this bit out, doesn't he? Opting instead to use the highest limit of 19% as his only number. Now, the genetic work behind Out of Africa as a hypothesis suggests that Homo sapiens left Africa around 60,000 years ago. The introgression of this mysterious ghost lineage that Robert brings up happened in West Africa 43,000 years ago, after the Homo sapiens genome was already well established and expanding out into the world. The ghost hominin itself split from our own lineage somewhere between 340,000 years ago and 1 million years ago, with a mean of 625,000 years ago. Even the older end of this range is too young to be Homo erectus, which emerged 2 million years ago, or the older Homo habilis, which emerged sometime between 2.3 and 2.8 million years ago. 
But better yet, Neanderthals and Denisovans split from the Homo sapiens lineage around 600,000 years ago, which is very similar to the mean for this ghost lineage's split. So while some races are generally seen to have small amounts of different ancient hominins in their DNA, these hominins are all equally as archaic. Not only that, but they each contributed their DNA through interspecific breeding with Homo sapiens well after the Homo sapiens genome was well established. So ancient humans were just kind of horny, I guess. However, this is well within the expectations of Darwinian evolution and acts as pretty awful support for racist ideas. That said, there's a significant difference between the terms anatomically modern or anatomically correct human and fully modern human. Modern humans do not appear in the fossil record until around 40,000 years ago. Anything that you hear about that's older than that, for example, 200,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, or even 70,000 years ago, may be called anatomically correct, but it's not fully modern, which must exhibit certain characteristics in terms of behavior, tool technology, and other phenotype attributes. Oh, okay. So all of those fossils that conventional science does deem as anatomically modern Homo sapiens, like for instance, the Omo-1 fossils from Africa, those just don't count because of uh, reasons. Now I think the Omo-1 fossils fit quite nicely into anatomically modern Homo sapiens, but let's hear the reasons that Robert gives. What, for instance, are the criteria to be modern humans, Robert? Of which the most important is the chin. Oh, interesting. Thought to come about by using the back molars to chew instead of the front canines, indicating an agricultural diet. And agriculture is the requisite for what we call civilization. I don't know what the heck he's talking about here. There is not a primate on earth that chews with its canine teeth. Moreover, I have absolutely never heard of the specific association he's referring to here of molars and agriculture. Generally speaking, agriculture makes eating foods easier, not more difficult. So potentially it adds to the gracility or more gracile jaws that humans possess. He says a few more incorrect things that he's gonna repeat in the next video, so we'll put a pin in those. Then Robert finishes the video by stealing my joke. This is a classic move because pseudoscientists are never funny. He's a pompous, ignorant clown, and he's not worth the construction paper that he drew his fake degree on. And if Robert did actually get a degree in anthropology, I'd be asking for a refund. Any anthropologist that does not agree or understand what I just said should go ask their university for a refund, as their degree is not worth the woke paper it was printed on. So like women aren't supposed to be funny to Robert Sepper and Robert Sepper fans, so why are you stealing my jokes? But with that video out of the way, let's assess. Did Robert address my genetics arguments? Did he talk about genetic diversity in Africa? Did he talk about phylogeny or heterozygosity or linkage disequilibrium? Did he retract his previous errors about Australopithecus and Ardipithecus mixing up the feet? Did he make any new arguments at all? Uh, the answer, it's no, as you just saw for yourself. It's, it's all the same stuff with a few new wrong things, but they're not really even arguments because they're not actually addressing the criticism that I made in my previous video. Good news though, and by good news, I mean bad news. There's actually a second video that we're about to go through right now, and it's called Darwin's DNA Dilemma. So if there was gonna be one that's gonna address my genetics arguments, it's gonna be this one. In fact, that's definitely what must have happened. Robert needed to get some quick jabs in at me, cover the bases, calm the fans, so he put out that first video, but he really wanted to take the time to research the genetic arguments that I made. So he was thinking to himself, I'm not gonna touch them in this video, but in this next one, that's where I'm really gonna break them down in a systematic and well-sourced fashion. I am positive that that is the case. So let's watch. 
The video begins as they all do. Robert does something mundane and a ukulele plays in the background. And I say that like it's a bad thing, but honestly, these are always the best part of a Robert Zepper video because he's usually interacting with some kind of cute animal and I can forget for just a moment that he's a lame grifter. Again, we'll get to that. Robert begins by talking briefly about Charles Darwin and he gives like a half decent summary of his voyage on the Beagle and to the Galapagos with the finches, etc, etc. Of course, as an anthropologist, turtles often remind me of the Galapagos Islands, which are famous for their large tortoises and where Charles Darwin laid the foundation for his theories concerning biological evolution. And then Robert brings up a new study and this study has changed everything. I guess if you read enough pop science articles, you just start to think like one. But are genetic mutations across the genome really random? Recent studies published in the journal Nature concerning certain types of small flowering weeds have led scientists to a new understanding about DNA mutations radically changing our understanding of evolution or how a species may change heritable characteristics over successive generations. My god, how interesting. No one informed me of this. Tell me more, Robert. Mutations occur when DNA is damaged and left unrepaired, creating a new variation. The scientists wanted to know if mutation was purely random or something deeper. What they found was unexpected. According to Gray Monroe, an assistant professor in the UC Davis Department of Plant Scientists, who is the lead author on the paper, quote, we always thought of mutation as basically random across the genome. It turns out that mutation is very non-random, and it's non-random in a way that benefits the plant. It's a totally new way of thinking about mutation. Instead of randomness, they found patches of the genome with low mutation rates. In other words, the plant is able to protect its genes from mutation to ensure survival, which upends the central assumption of Darwin's theory that these variations arise randomly and that only natural selection determines which genes change more quickly and which more slowly in the course of evolution. So the paper that Robert's talking about here is titled Mutation Bias Reflects Natural Selection in Arabidopsis thaliana. Arabidopsis thaliana is just, it's a plant. You don't really need to know too much about it. And what the study aimed to do is catalog the de novo mutation rates in the genome of this particular weed, Arabidopsis, and they report that when they're looking at the mutation rates in the genome of this plant, there were fewer deleterious mutations in important regions of the genome, functionally important regions of the genome. And then they go on to suggest that perhaps there's some kind of epigenetic control going on here to prevent bad things from happening in vital areas of the genome. This was big because obviously it's suggesting that evolution isn't necessarily entirely directionless. And it kind of led everybody else who read it to go, mm, well, is it really true though? How true is it? Let's replicate it ourselves. And this led to a paper being released early this August that kind of overturned, or at least did not confirm the results of the earlier paper. A couple of folks examined basically the same thing in baker's yeast and in humans, and here's what they had to say. We find that the Arabidopsis study identified substantially more mutations than reported in the original data, generating studies and expected from Arabidopsis's mutation rate. These extra mutations are enriched in polynucleotide tracts and have relatively low sequence quality, so are likely sequencing errors. Furthermore, the polynucleotide mutations can produce the purported mutational trend in Arabidopsis. Together, our results do not support lower mutagenesis of genomic regions of stronger selective constraints in the plant fungal and animal models examined. Oops. Friend of the channel, Joel Duff, did a much more in-depth video comparing these two papers over on his channel, so I do suggest you check that out, link in the description. But notice as well that when Robert is quoting the author of the paper, he's taken that from a pop science article yet again, supporting my hypothesis that he does not read the papers that he cites. Moving on, Robert talks about Darwin's finches and gives a decent summary of it, and then he proceeds to apply these finch observations and specializations to hominin skulls and human races. Strap in, boys! This same reasoning holds true 
with the various hominin species that genomic sequencing has revealed are contained in our DNA with various degrees of admixture distributed among the various racial groups on Earth. In the case of the hominin skull, a properly trained anthropologist, which in the modern era are few and far between, should be able to determine the specimen's diet based on a degree of prognathism, which means how far the mouth sticks out from the face. Okay, so again, the degree of prognathism is not nearly as important to determining diet in ancient hominins when compared to the size and the shape of the teeth, as well as the microware that is imprinted on the enamel of these teeth. But I was feeling a little bit crazy hearing Robert repeat this idea about prognathism's relationship to diet over and over again, so I hopped on over to Google Scholar to see exactly how many people have published on this relationship, or even reference it in their papers? And the answer was not very many. Some talked about the nature of prognathism with relation to the size and shape of the temporalis and masseter muscles, which attach along the sagittal crest on the side of the head and down towards the mandible. And this is important with regards to processing foods, but let's give an example here. This is Paranthropus boisei. It's a sister species to members of Australopithecus and then later members of Homo. And you'll notice that while the face is a bit prognathic, it's nothing as compared to, say, a chimpanzee, which is significantly more prognathic or snouty. But this animal, Paranthropus boisei, eats much harder foods <clears throat> and must process these foods using its powerful muscles on the sides of its face and jaws, as compared to a chimp, which is mostly eating softer foods like fruits, berries, things like that. We can get a secondary confirmation of this by looking at the jaws, the mandibles of these organisms, as well as the teeth that sit within them. This is the lower mandible, again, of genus Paranthropus, and you'll see that the molars are gigantic. They're huge, and they're very low-cusped and bunodont for crushing and grinding things up like a mortar and pestle. When we look at a chimpanzee, you can see that the molars are much higher cusped and they tend to be quite a bit smaller. When you hold them side by side, the molars of Paranthropus are two to three times the size of the molars of chimpanzees. So again, it, it boils down to the teeth, not so much the jaws. This isn't to say that the jaws are unimportant, but when we're talking about diet, the teeth are the name of the game. Homo erectus, or Homo habilis, for example, were strictly hunter-gatherers for over two million years up until the end of the Pleistocene, or Ice Age. Hunter-gatherers tend to live in groups of about 40 individuals, as they do not survive as well in numbers greater or less than 40. There were never any civilizations of hunter-gatherers that developed metal tools, built megalithic structures, established armies, or achieved anything associated with modern humans. They are considered super-archaic, a term that denotes that they were considered very primitive as opposed to Cro-Magnon, for example. So this is kind of weird to me because humans, as in Homo sapiens, the species, was non-agricultural and entirely made up of hunter-gatherers for at least 280,000 years. But even if we go by Robert's idea of what is truly Homo sapiens, just 40,000 years ago to present, and only Europeans, evidently, that's still 20,000 years, at least, of hunter-gatherer lifestyles. And even longer, if you want to talk about metallurgy and domesticating horses and other more classically domesticated animals outside of dogs and cats. Which is fully modern. Cro-Magnon is the only hominin that had a prominent chin. It first shows up in the fossil record around 40,000 years ago, with no prognathism implying that it used its back molars to chew, a trait attributed to having a mostly agricultural diet. Okay, so one, modern humans still do have light prognathism. We just have flatter faces when compared to the Miocene apes that came before us. But again, teeth are really what we need to look at to determine diet. And when compared to the likes of Homo erectus, our teeth haven't really changed all that much except for the fact that they've gotten smaller. Now this may have to do with the incorporation of agriculture down the line because we were capable of having more gracile jaws due to the lack of a need to really process our food as much as some of the earlier hominins did, but really this is gonna have more to do with the advent of fire and cooking to soften things like meat in order to make it easier for us to chew up and swallow. 
And this is something that we can test pretty easily today, given there are still humans that live a hunter-gatherer lifestyle, and their teeth are not significantly different than ones who descend from centuries upon centuries of agriculturalists and pastoralists. And just like those early Homo sapiens fossils from Africa and everywhere else, those pastoralists, agriculturalists, and hunter-gatherers all have chins. Cro-Magnon were also the first to use bifacial stone tool technology. In spears and bow and arrows, there's evidence that they lived in wooden houses, they were seafaring, kept track of celestial patterns, and the first to domesticate animals used in large-scale agriculture, such as horses and oxen. Okay, so the first evidence for agriculture comes from the Fertile Crescent in Mesopotamia, which is now the Middle East, and metallurgy evidence also appears here first. The first to domesticate dogs were folks that lived in Siberia. So again, not Europe, and it's very similar with the case for horses, which probably come from Perswolski's horse herds that now live on the Mongolian steppes. Bifacial stone tools, using constellations to navigate, and of course, using boats to sail are also found in pretty much every human population group, especially once we get into 20,000 years ago or more recent. This isn't an only Europe thing, Robert, and to say otherwise is to just deny massive amounts of data in favor of something that you find more palatable. No doubt Europeans invented a lot of cool stuff all throughout history, but a lot of other places did too, and unfortunately for a lot of early Europeans, it would be a while before this would be a hub of cultural exchange. And cultural exchange is kind of the engine of most human achievements. If we can't exchange ideas, it becomes very difficult to deviate from the norm and come up with new ideas. These domesticated animals are a requisite for Stone Age agricultural civilization, and while the cataclysms that ended the Pleistocene have left anthropologists very little direct evidence of Ice Age farming. Like the finch beaks, the skull structure of Cro-Magnon, including its chin, lack of prognathism, and massive cranial capacity, which is larger than today's hybridized average, speaks to its almost certain agricultural lifestyle and high cognitive ability. Okay, so see, there it is. I don't have any evidence that Cro-Magnon, which again is a very outdated term that almost no one uses in the modern literature, at least how Robert uses it, I may not have any evidence that my guys were the first to do agriculture, but trust me, they did. And then he falls back on the morphology, which again, as I already discussed here, there is no connection between relative levels of prognathism and agriculture, not that we can pin down, which is why there isn't any, any literature on it, which is probably why Robert doesn't cite any. Part of the problem with this too is that the advent of agriculture didn't drastically change the relative toughness or hardness of any of the foods that humans were eating. We were already cooking things by the time agriculture rules are long, and so cooked meats and fruits and certain tubers and vegetables that we found, this is not very difficult to chew up and to digest. So the advent of grain, whilst it did broaden the horizon of resources we could exploit, this wasn't significantly different or outside of the box of what we were eating before, at least with regard to the masticatory process required for it. He talks briefly about how Darwin probably had Cro-Magnon ancestry. I don't care. And then he moves on to finally talking about out of Africa. The problem for the out of Africa replacement model is that DNA sequencing of a 28,000 year old Cro-Magnon type specimen has revealed that it was almost genetically identical to modern European populations. If Cro-Magnon is identical to modern European populations, then when did this alleged evolution and mutation from sub-Saharan Africans allegedly take place? Our species is 300,000 years old, Robert. The specimen you're talking about is 28,000 years old. So the evolution from the African ancestors into all of the geographic descendants at the time, 28,000 years ago and indeed today, took place in the roughly 270,000 years in between. It's not difficult math. The fact that Cro-Magnon and its direct descendants in Europe and Asia do not contain genetic admixture from super archaic hominins such as Homo erectus or Homo habilis which has recently been discovered in the DNA of modern sub-Saharan populations in West Africa, 
that is not found in the DNA of modern Asians or Caucasians poses a big problem for the out-of-Africa replacement hypothesis, which proposes that sub-Saharan Africans mutated into Asians and Europeans roughly 35,000 years ago when Cro-Magnon, or early modern humans, suddenly shows up in the fossil record. Okay, so again, no, this ghost lineage DNA that's found in some groups of folks from West Africa comes from a species that separated from Homo sapiens from our lineage 600,000 years ago. That's when it split off. The actual admixture itself from the very same paper that Robert is drawing his current claims from occurred 43,000 years ago, well after humans had already left Africa with their genome already established. The reason why Asians and Europeans, as Robert likes to put it, don't have this admixture is because they weren't in the geographic area. Why don't African individuals have Denisovans DNA? Because Denisovans lived in Asia. I mean, to be abundantly clear here, he's just mutilating the literature to try to make a point. He's trying to force it to say something it abjectly does not say. That's not how anthropologists act, Robert. Is it? With the advent of genomic sequencing, the out of Africa model falls apart. And this supposed linear progression of hominin species that mainstream anthropologists insist took place is looking more and more like a fairy tale. Okay, so Robert still hasn't caught over the genetics arguments that are the entire reason why we accept out of Africa as a factual part of our evolution. I'm not really sure why, but Either way, I'm just going to go ahead and play my clip from the previous video so you really understand how airtight this support really is. Okay, time for paper number one to show why Robert Supper doesn't know what he's talking about. Again, special thanks to Dan of Creation Myths because he's the one that gathered all these together for a different video. So this paper is by U et al. 2002 and it's titled Larger Genetic Differences Within Africans Than Between Africans and Eurasians. So what this is effectively looking at is diversity. And we know because of the basics of population genetics that as organisms leave the population that they were born and raised in and split off with other little members of their group to found new populations elsewhere, their genetic diversity is going to be lower than the place that they originated. This is called the founder effect and it's a type of genetic drift. So if humans originated in Africa, what we should expect is that Africans or folks who live in Africa uh, and were born there and descend from individuals who are from there should have greater genetic diversity than non-Africans. And what they did is they sequenced some genes, some non-coding DNA segments, excuse me, 500 base pair longs in 10 African 10 Europeans and 10 Asians. And this was just a really basic analysis that they performed. And if we scroll down to their results section, you get this nice figure titled figure one. On the x-axis, we have nucleotide diversity, and on the y-axis, we have the proportion of subsamples. So the wider the curve is, the more diverse the group. And as we can see, African uh, individuals have are a part of this wider group here, meaning that they have more genetic diversity than these skinnier little pyramid shapes here, or little triangle shapes here, that are made up by Europeans and Asians. In fact, this was one of the first papers to note the following. This finding, that is the results of their paper, implies that Africans differ on average more among themselves than from Eurasians. Thus, with the exception of many minor unique variants, the nucleotide diversity in Eurasians is essentially a subset of that in Africans, as observed by the observation that both Y-linked and autosomal haplotypes found outside of Africa were often a subset of the collection of haplotypes found in Africa. African individuals are more genetically diverse than non-African individuals, adding support for the out-of-Africa hypothesis for Homo sapiens, the species, around 50 to 70,000 years ago. Let's talk about phylogeny next. Now, you might be thinking, sure, but that last paper was from 2002. Maybe Robert is right, and people have been moving away from out of Africa since then. Wrongo, this paper is from 2012, and the rest of the papers we'll be looking at are also quite recent. This one looks at nesting with haplotypes from mitochondrial DNA. And what I hope should be immediately obvious, so we've got a lot of different people groups uh, and non-human hominid groups here plotted, and they nest within each other. So what that means is 
Um, the more things coalesce, right, as things coalesce back here towards the split between humans and chimps, the more ancient sort of the, the split has occurred. So what we see is the oldest split that happens after humans and chimps is the out of Africa event at 80,000 years ago. What that means is that everyone is in Africa at this time, at the coalescence of all humans. The out of Africa event happens, there's a split, and you get Europeans and Asians, Eurasians, and way down here with the little green Americans, right? individuals making it to North and South America. And in a heat map down here, you can see it even more starkly with the L0 most ancient haplogroup being right here in Sub-Saharan Africa. Subsequently, we've got L2 and L3, slightly less ancient, but ancient nonetheless, more ancient than all of these other different groups, and slowly everything spreads out. So everything nests using mitochondrial DNA, DNA, excuse me, DNA, mitochondrial DNA, everything nests within Africa, yet again. So what we've seen so far is we've got the phylogeny nesting us deep within Africa and human diversity nesting deep within Africa. What else can we compare? How about heterozygosity? right? So you should remember heterozygosity from like middle school, high school biology. Heterozygosity just refers to the fact that if you're heterozygous for something, then you've got the two alleles or two variants of a given gene. So if you'll remember from Punnett square days, making little Punnett squares, it, let's say you've got big A, little a, and big A means tall and little a means short. If you have big A, little a, then you have both the tall and short alleles. Now let's say you have big A, big A, then you've got both tall alleles and your homozygous dominant. If you have little a, little a, then you've got both the little, both the short alleles, the little a alleles, and that means you are homozygous recessive for that trait. Now, due to things like genetic drift, which is a classic mechanism of evolution, if you've got this big ancestral population and little subpopulations split off from it or butt off from it to go do their own thing, they have a higher possibility for the homozygous individuals to reach fixation in those groups, right? So if you're a little a, little a, it's gonna be pretty hard to move to fixation in a big population. But if you manage to be present in a small population, your odds are a little bit better. So what this means is that the more heterozygous a population, the older or more ancient or more diverse it is. So what that basically means is if a population is super homozygous, it probably split off from a different heterozygous population and is thus not the ancestor of all other populations. So if out of Africa is correct, then we should find high prevalence of heterozygosity in Africa. And that's what this paper sought to do. So this is Herrera's 2009, and they were looking at heterozygosity in particular. Figure one is this nice guy right here, and what they've done is mapped heterozygosity. Nice and neat for us. Move up a little bit here so you can see. Okay, so in pink we have the Americas, turquoise, turquoise excuse me, is Central and South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa is going to be in red. So what we should expect to see is that the redder the individual, the more heterozygous the population. And as you scroll down here to D, what you can see is that red individuals are indeed the most heterozygous. The conclusion that they state is our analysis both confirm and extend previous studies. In particular, we highlight the impact of various dispersals and the role of substructure in Africa on human genetic diversity. We also identified several novel candidate regions for recent positive selection, which is pretty cool. Among the novel candidate genes were two genes involved in the thyroid hormone that show signals of selection in African pygmies that may be related to their short stature. So a third paper, heterozygosity, again, supports out of Africa or a human origin in Africa. What should we do next? I think we got one more paper to discuss. Lastly is linkage disequilibrium. So linkage disequilibrium should be higher as you move away from Africa because linkage disequilibrium is indicative in part of small populations. Small populations tend to split off from larger ones. So we should see uh, linkage disequilibrium increase as you move away from Africa. So this study did something really cool. They took the capital of Ethiopia, which is Addis Ababa, and they basically plotted relative levels of linkage disequilibrium or equilibrium oh, as you move further and further away from Addis Ababa. And as you can see again here, this is the SNP haplotype heterozygosity versus distance from Addis Ababa or AA. And you get this linear regression slope 
Um, and what you can see is that Africa is again in red, then Europe in green, Middle East in sort of maroon, all the way down to the Americas in purple. And what you see is as you move away from Addis Ababa in kilometers, so 25,000 kilometers away versus 5,000 or less, African individuals show more linkage, linkage equilibrium than individuals who are further away, suggesting that Africa is again the spot where everyone split off from. So, like, I'm embarrassing myself if I do that. I was also thinking about getting a sticker <laughs> on my G top. Yeah, this is not good. With that in mind, do you feel as though Robert has been sufficient in debunking these points? Let me know in the comments section. Now, there's still four minutes left in his video. Although I know at least two of those are him probably going to a restaurant and eating something. So there's two minutes left in the video. Maybe the answer lies there. In my last episode, which I'll leave a link to in the description, I talked about some of the various problems that still exist in the fossil record, linking mankind with alleged tree-dwelling ancestors. Okay, so the spoiler is that no, he never addresses any of the arguments that I presented via genetics, and he just references his previous video as if the answers lie there. Now, we just watched that video, so we know that they do not. He moves on and talks about how the fact that there are multiple human blood types, specifically rhesus negative, means that we could not have descended from a common ancestor. And then he kind of supports this by saying, see, no other ape or primate has Rh negative blood. And to that I say, no, but they also have different blood types, some of which are not compatible with one another within the same species, just like in humans. So if you're taking Robert's argument to its conclusion, then none of them can share common ancestors either, sometimes within their own species. If mankind evolved from the same ancestor, then everyone's blood would be compatible, but it's not. Blood types just arise naturally as a part of mutation and natural selection. This is why most species, most mammals, tend to have them. In The Origin of Species, Charles Darwin says little about human evolution, other than to assert firmly that we humans did evolve and are part of the interrelated natural world along with all other organisms. Oh really, Robert? Then why did he write a whole ass book about it? Where, among other things, he asserts that human races all share a common ancestor. Was the descent of man too woke for you, Robert? Is that why you never read it? Robert Sepper cancelled by a man who lived almost 200 years ago. That said, a direct transitional link between mankind and arboreal or tree-dwelling ancestors has not yet been established in the fossil record which is why articles are still published using terms such as missing link. We have so many missing links between the arboreal Miocene apes and anatomically modern humans that we simply don't know what to do with all of them. Wait, I'm getting deja vu. Oh, Robert, you silly goose. We have so many hominins, we simply don't know what to do with all of them. Let's name them all, spanning from 7 million years ago to present. Sing along with me. We have Sahelanthropus chidensis, Aurorantugenensis, Ardipithecus cadaba, Ardipithecus ramidus, Australopithecus anamensis, Australopithecus africanus, Australopithecus afarensis, Australopithecus garhi, Australopithecus diaromita, Australopithecus baral gazali, Australopithecus sediba, Paranthropus robustus, Paranthropus ethiopicus, Paranthropus boisei, Homo habilis, Canianthropus platyops, Homo rudolfensis, Homo georgicus, or Homo erectus, depending on who you talk to. Homo ergaster, or Homo erectus, depending on who you talk to. And Homo erectus. All of these in Africa. All of them before the emergence of any of the modern members of Homo, which would merge after Homo sapiens leaves Africa, and indeed Homo erectus before it. After Homo erectus leaves Africa, we see the emergence of things like Homo neanderthalensis, Homo denisovans, or Homo longi, depending on what ends up happening there, Homo floresiensis, Homo lusinensis, and Homo naledi, and indeed, probably many more whom we will continue to find. Then Robert suggests that ancient mythology must have had it right all along. Yes, all of them. And he also thinks that some 20th century governments also had it right. Some 20th century governments. Some 20th century- Perhaps the apparent gap in humanity's origins 
has already been solved by the ancient mythologies of the world, which secret societies, occult organizations, and some governments of the 20th century took seriously, while modern academia continues its search for the ever-elusive missing link. Just some food for thought. And then he eats fish again on camera. All this talk of food has made me hungry, and I decided to stop by at one of my favorite restaurants in Calabasas. So Robert Sepper responded to my video by doubling down on his more ridiculous points and then coming up with new dumb ideas to add to the mix, all the while ignoring the criticism that I levied against him and neglecting to read even the sources that he claims to support him. For this reason, I have decided that Robert Sepper is not a bad anthropologist. He is a grifter. A grifter is defined as someone who engages in small-scale swindling, which is exactly what I would call someone who has an undergraduate degree in anthropology and yet claims that he is the only one that has it right. Out of all of the anthropologists, thousands of people through the years, all with multiple more degrees than Robert. Now, if he was just disagreeing, that would be fine. I think that what makes this swindling is the fact that Robert I think has demonstrated that he knows better, and yet he appeals to this group of folks who kind of feel like they've peeked behind the curtain, and Robert is taking advantage of that. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, okay. Robert Sepper repeats points that he has been corrected on. He uses almost exclusively pop science articles to support his ideas, and of course, he argues with the most out-of-date possible versions of the idea that he is trying to fight against and debunk. None of this is the behavior of a person who has an anthropology degree and cares about it. No, this has led me to believe that Robert is not, in fact, stupid, but that instead, I think that he knows better and likes the attention and the money. And I think maybe he's bought into his own bullshit just a little bit. Like Ken Tobin, he has amassed a group of people that kind of idolize him. And that's pretty decent for, you know, YouTube. In the grand scheme of things, Robert's influence is microscopic. The power he must feel, being affirmed by thousands of people that feel that they and they alone have managed to see past the trickery of academia, it must be intoxicating. It's something that I, the owner and operator of a much, 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 much smaller channel, could never hope to experience. No, I am but a simple stooge of academia, an institution that views Robert Sepper and his fans as quite similar to creationists, unimportant and about as influential and threatening as the flat earth community. Academia is far from perfect, and in my opinion, it should be significantly more transparent than it currently is, but most people can access the ivory towers through the internet a science hub, perhaps, and they can see the reasoning for human evolution for themselves. It's not a black box for people who truly want to learn. Robert Sepper has no such desire. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. This was a fun video to make. I hope it was fun for you as well. Feel free to argue with Robert Sepper fans in the comment section because they will show up but they are very fragile, so remember to go easy on them. Uh, this may or may not be the last video I make on Robert Sepper, uh, because he's pretty fun to poke fun at, but at the same time, he's, he's not like super worth it. It's kind of like in the standing for truth bin, if you will. He's probably gonna get mad and make another passive aggressive, like vaguely directed at me response. If he's smart, he won't respond at all, but we'll see. This semester is going to be particularly rough for me because I am head TA at my university, so I'm teaching multiple labs, I'm in charge of the other people teaching those labs, and then I'm also taking my own graduate courses in addition to sifting through the data that I gathered at the National Museums of Kenya this summer, so I'm, I'm pretty slammed. But 
I still am shooting for one video or hopefully more per week if I can get to it. So as usual, thank you so much for supporting the channel just by watching it. If you want to support more in a free way, you can like, like, comment, subscribe, feed the algorithm. It's a very strange deity, but it does respond to these kinds of things I have learned. And if you would like to support in a more financial way, you can join my Patreon or you can buy my merchandise through Redbubble or you can donate through PayPal. And I'm going to set up the super thanks function as well. I'm launching a Discord here soon that only patrons will have access to, so that will be pretty cool. You'll be able to reach me in a pretty easy way through that medium, so consider becoming a patron if you would like. And in the meantime, please do take care of yourselves out there, folks. Try to keep the monkey business to a minimum.